is our first uh, Facebook Live worship service that we're trying today, and we're glad to have you with us this morning. Um, if you have your Book of Common Prayer handy at home, you can follow along. I will give the page numbers as we go through the service, uh, or you can download from our website our latest uh, weekly service bulletin and follow along in that as well. Uh, my name is the Reverend Allison Cornell, and we're glad to have you with us this morning. We've got some music and some prayers, some readings, and a sermon that are coming your way. And in a little while, we'll be doing communion as well. If you will please turn to page 38 in the Book of Common Prayer or on the first page of your bulletin. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Page 41 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Saying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises, declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On page 42, open, Lord, O Lord, open thou our lips. And, and our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory, Glory to, to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, is, is now, and will be forever. forever. Amen.
first reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse a Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Samuel hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and saying, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sacrifice yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or in the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not shown any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from Ephesians. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. Everything exposed to the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. As Jesus walked along, he saw a, blind, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how are your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Well, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, 
so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our Gospel lesson this morning, at the beginning of it, the disciples, when they see this blind man, ask Jesus, Who is it that sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. The disciples are trying to understand something that is from Jewish tradition that goes all the way back to the first five books of the Bible. In the Exodus, Moses is leading the Israelites, and when he's out in the wilderness, he receives the commandments, and along with the commandments, he is told that anyone who sins and who does not repent of their sin... Good morning. We had some difficulties yesterday uh, during our Sunday service with recording my sermon, so I'm going to do it from my laptop here in my office. Now yesterday we read the gospel lesson of the man who was born blind, and at the beginning of the gospel lesson, the disciples asked Jesus, so who was it that sinned, this man or his parents? Now, the disciples are thinking about the uh, Jewish tradition uh, that specifies that when something bad has befallen a person, it's usually because somebody has sinned, that, that God is uh, meeting out some correction or punishment on somebody because they've sinned and failed to repent of that sin. And uh, so they're thinking about two different instances in the Old Testament. In the first five books of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, Moses has uh, taken the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery, and are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it's during that time that Moses receives the Ten Commandments and some additional instructions from God. In Exodus, we hear that God says that those who sin and who do not repent of their sins those sins will then carry forward onto their children, their children's children, and their children's children's children into the third and fourth generations. Now, I don't know, but I suspect this might have been a deterrent um, that God was saying to those who sin that, um, think about what you're about to do. If you're about to break one of the Ten Commandments, that uh, the punishment for that, the, the, the consequences for that, will not just fall on you, but will also fall on your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, possibly. Um, so maybe that would give people pause before they decided that they were going to do something that would break those Ten Commandments. There's a saying in the Old Testament that reflects this that says, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the actions of the parents are then felt by the children. So that's in Exodus, at the very beginning of our story with the Jewish folks. Um, later, when you get up to uh, the 500 BC time frame, uh, Jeremiah, who was a prophet, rose to try and instruct the Jewish people, especially Jewish leaders that were leading the people, to return to the ways of God, that they had fallen down in their observance of the um, the commandments and the rules and, and the ways of God and uh, tries to call them back saying that bad things are going to happen and indeed they get conquered and taken off into uh, Babylon in exile. And about the time that the, the city of Jerusalem falls, Jeremiah uh, says that things have changed now, that God has told him to tell the people that no longer will the sins of the parents be visited on to the children. That now each person's individual sins, they will be accountable for to themselves. Uh, in Jeremiah it says, no longer will they say that the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but rather everyone who eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. Getting back to our gospel lesson, those are the two situations that I suspect the disciples are thinking about. 
Is it because of the Exodus way of understanding things that um, that the children are re are receiving misfortune because of something that the parents have done, or is it because of what uh, this blind man has done uh, himself to deserve this blindness to be visited upon him? And Jesus replies that neither, neither the parents nor the man has done anything wrong. They have not sinned, and this is not a punishment from God uh, because of that. In, instead, he says that this man's blindness is going to be an indicator of how God can show God's glory through a dramatic healing. Now, the Bible contains similar stories about God being able to take a bad situation and turn it around for the good. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is in Genesis. We have Joseph, the youngest brother of uh, the other brothers of Jacob, and uh, he's kind of dad's favorite, which is a bit annoying to his older brothers. So one day they decide to sell Joseph into slavery, and he ends up in Egypt, and through God's perhaps interfer interference, he ends up in Pharaoh's household and rises to a, a position of prominence over the years. Later, the brothers come seeking help, uh, relief from famine, and they're reunited. And Joseph tells his brothers, he says, you intended this action of selling me into slavery uh, for evil, but God was able to turn it to the good. In another situation where you know about Job, uh, Job was a man who was faithful in his, uh, in his worship of God and following God's commandments. He was a man who had uh, amassed some wealth and had a large family and was in good health. And then God and the devil decide to get into a little contest to see if they can turn Job away from his faithful observer observation of, uh, of commandments and worship to God. So unfortunately for Job, he sees his entire family die. He loses his wealth and he himself loses his health and he becomes very sick and covered in sores. And some of his friends come over one day to spend some time with him in compassion. And that lasts for about three days before they finally say, you know, look, Job, you must have done something wrong to deserve what has happened to you. You must have done something to anger God. And that's why all of this bad stuff has happened. And Job, of course, says, no, I've been faithful to God. I remain faithful to God. Uh, I have followed the commandments. I don't understand why it's happening to me, but I will continue to be faithful to God. And uh, as a result of his faithfulness, later, of course, Job gets everything back that he had lost. He gets another wife and family, his wealth returns, and his health improves. So God is able to reverse those uh, bad things that were put there as a test. Now, it's human nature to sometimes wonder why do bad things happen to good people? And if it happens to us, for us to wonder, what have I done to deserve this? Given how things have unfolded in the last several weeks with the pandemic, I suspect that there are a number of people that are trying to interpret what is happening around the world as some sort of punishment from God, that we have angered God, that we have sinned in some way and that is the reason for why this is happening. And people are probably trying to ask themselves, is it something that I've done? Is it something that we as a, as a group of people have done? It's because we have this tendency as humans to try and find the source of something that's happened so that we can correct it, put it, an end to it. Um, that we look for a place to be angry, to dump our anger and hurt when we are hurt by a situation to find out, you know, who is to blame? Who is at fault for this? Now, I know that based on what's happened and the restrictions that have been put in place in a number of ways, that there are folks that, you know, have caught the disease and are asking, you know, why is this happening to me or to my family? I read an article a couple of days ago about a family of seven in which four have already died and the other three are hospitalized. Terrible tragedy for that family and others that are dealing with similar circumstances. There are people who cannot work because they cannot 
get to their work, their work has been shut down or they've been laid off because of a lack of business. And they're wondering, why is this happening? How am I going to pay my bills? Parents that are trying to work from home and homeschool their kids at the same time and to keep the kids entertained or occupied. People that were supposed to be on vacation and visiting either family or friends or tourist destinations and can't do that right now. People that are stuck away from home and who can't get back home because of travel bans that are in place. The folks that are working in the grocery stores and, and pharmacies and other stores that are dealing with scared and panicky and ill-tempered customers and having to restock shelves constantly and working long hours and overtime just to keep things available for those that come uh, looking for them. Doctors and nurses and other medical professionals who are on the front lines of having to deal with this disease as it unfolds in our nation and around the world, who are facing uh, their own overwhelming hours and, and uh, attempts to try and stop the disease and a shortage of supplies. And then the researchers that are looking to try and come up with some kind of a cure or treatment to help um, those that have become ill and to prevent those uh, who might be at risk from becoming ill. All around the world, people are having to deal in many ways with this virus and may be asking themselves, what is it that I have done or that we have done? And the simple answer is nothing. Just like Jesus told his disciples. There's not any one person or group of people that are to blame for what is happening. Viruses have been a part of living on earth for a very long time. We've dealt with multiple outbreaks over the years and this will continue to be true as we go forward from here. But what, it, what does happen when we encounter something new, a new virus, is that we often have greater understanding of viruses and how they work and how they spread and what their effects are on the human body. And usually out of these will come not only new understanding, but new treatments, new ways of making ourselves more resilient or immune. And that might be the blessing that comes out of this when we get through to the other side. In the meantime, we have to deal with things the way they are. Now, Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples, he said that this man's blindness is so that the glory of God could be shown. And maybe the glory of God is beginning to be seen around the world and in our communities. There are signs. Signs of people that are looking out for one another, checking on their family and friends and neighbors to see how they can help. If there's anything they can do for somebody who doesn't feel safe to get out right now and feels like that they need to remain home in isolation to prevent getting this. There are people that are volunteering at various charities such as food pantries and, and meal creation and delivery services. Um, those that are looking to try and, and take care of those that are most vulnerable in our communities. Taking their neighbor's dogs for walkies or, or sharing supplies that are hard to find, such as toilet paper or hand sanitizer. And we here at St. Stephen's are doing many of those same things. We continue to uh, call each other and to keep in touch with one another and to be available. And if there's something that any of you need, please do call the church and either myself or one of the other folks that's willing to run errands will be happy to do so or to share supplies that we might have. Uh, we can put out a call for something if you find that you're in need. Um, and that's the things that we do in times like this is we take care of one another. We look out for one another. And we continue to hold you and the church and our community and the nation and the world in prayer. Prayers that we continue to uh, show that kind of consideration and compassion for one another in looking out for one another and to, uh, to not turn uh, mean-spirited towards each other. Now we realize that as the days continue and, and more and more states are uh, sheltering in place, and I suspect that will happen for us in the near future, um, you might find that you've got some extra time on your hands that you 
would otherwise be uh, using in, in other activities, whether that's work activities or, or other social activities. So what can you do with your time? Well, I would say first off, pray. Add your prayers to those that are already being said here and around the world uh, for this to end up in uh, some sort of recovery and a vaccine becoming available or treatment becoming available. Uh, that we all can step up where we can to help make that a reality. So keep those prayers coming. Spend some quiet time in contemplation or meditation and listening for God. Uh, that's always a comfort when we feel like we are alone, uh, to be able to sit quietly and to recognize that, no, we are not alone, that God is always with us and surrounding us with his love and his care. Um, sit outside in the sunshine or go for a walk in your neighborhood, of course, maintaining distance as we've been asked to do, um, but write letters or make phone calls or send emails to people to keep in touch so that we don't have that feeling of being alone and isolated. Try a new recipe. Do some creative work, some painting or drawing or coloring or needlepoint or any of a number of craft kinds of things uh, to have a creative outlet during this time, or do nothing at all, just rest. Use this as a time to catch up on maybe some well-needed rest for you, your soul, and your body. Read a book, tackle that in-home project that you've been thinking about. Do your census online so you don't have to be visited by a census taker. Those are all possibilities, and above all, just don't panic. Do not fear, you are not alone, your church is here for you, and of course, God is here for you. And on the other side of this, once the pandemic has lessened, come to an end, we may find that God's glory is indeed shown by how we came together, not just in our community, but around the world. How humanity put aside differences and judgment and prejudices and realize that we are indeed globally all in this together and fighting for ourselves and our communities to be well. And maybe some of our more hateful or distrustful or uh, envious natures will have put to, been put to bed and we will see that we are all one and that we can when we need to, and hopefully this will last, love one another by taking care of one another. Jesus' disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus replies, neither. Neither one is to blame. No one here is to blame. And as the song Amazing Grace says, maybe this will be one of those instances where all of us have our blindness removed. For once I was blind, but now I see. Amen. All right. So if we can say the collar for today, which is part of your purple insert, which is on page number four. Say it together. Gracious Father, who blessed the Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread, which gives life to the world, Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us, and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. of praise and thanksgiving, make good your vows to the Most High.
hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying,
common prayer on page 337 with the invitation to communion. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Our birthday prayer. O oh God, our times are in your hands. 
Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if it's your anniversary, O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and the church. Send therefore your blessing upon your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And for healing, O oh God, the strength of the weak and comfort of the suffering, mercifully accept our prayers and grant to your servants the help of your power, that sickness and distress may be turned into health and sorrow into joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One little other additional piece uh, to address before we move to our post-communion prayer. Dottie, if you'll come up. We have some of you who have requested communion, and Dottie is going to be making at least one of those visits. I may be making another one. So we have our communion kits up here ready to go, and they were included in the blessing that we did earlier. Dottie, I send you to our friends in Christ in the name of the church and this congregation to share the one body of our Lord. I am honored to share. I am honored to serve Christ and our friends in this way. May the blessings of the Holy Eucharist go with you and the love of God in Christ be shared with our friends. Amen. Amen. Post-Communion prayer can be found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 339 or in our bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee, for Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. We thank you for joining us for our online worship today. And I ask that may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Let us remain at home and remain faithful in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. God.
Sabe? 